in this video we'll study about the side of the neck the side of the neck is somewhat quadrilateral in shape and it is concave above downwards when you see the limitations or boundaries anteriorly in front it is limited by the anterior median line behind by the anterior border of the trapezius muscle above by the lower border of the mandible the line joining the angle of the mandible and the mastoid process and below by the clavicle so this is divided by the sternocleidomastoid muscle which is present diagonally so this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle and this divides the side of the neck into two triangles the anterior triangle and the posterior triangle so next we'll see the superficial structures of the neck the superficial structures of the neck include the skin the superficial fascia with platysma muscle the superficial veins and the nerves and the investing layer of deep cervical fascia so these superficial structures of the neck forms the roof of the posterior and the anterior triangles next we'll see the skin of the neck the skin of the neck the longus line is disposed horizontally and if you see the cutaneous innervation of the neck it is derived from the c2 to c4 spinal nerves since the c1 spinal nerve has no cutaneous branch and the ventral rami of c5 to t1 that forms the brachial plexus to supply the upper limb the cutaneous innervation of the neck is derived segmentally from c2 c3 and c4 nerves so this intervenes between the trigeminal nerve above and t2 nerve below the anterolateral part of the neck is supplied by the ventral rami in the form of four nerves so that include the lesser occipital the great auricular the transverse cervical cutaneous and the supraclavicular nerves so the anterolateral part is supplied by four cutaneous nerves the lesser occipital the great auricular the transverse cutaneous nerve of neck and the supra clavicular nerves so these four nerves supplies the anterolateral part which are derived from the ventral rami whereas the dorsal rami that supplies the posterior part of the neck that includes this dorsal rami of c2 the dorsal rami of c3 and the c4 so they supply the broad posterior part of the neck and also supplies the posterior part of the scalp next we'll see the superficial fascia the superficial fascia consists of loose areolar tissue and the fat and it also has the subcutaneous muscle that is the platysma next we'll see the platysma muscle the platysma muscle is a subcutaneous muscle which is present in the neck and it is quadrilateral in outline and it is the remnant of the muscle called panniculus carnosus muscle it developed from the second branchial arch hence it is supplied by the facial nerve and the superficial veins and the cutaneous nerves of the neck lie beneath this muscle origin the platysma muscle takes origin from the fascia covering the pectoralis major muscle and the anterior part of the deltoid muscle and it passes upward and forward and gets inserted most of the fibers is inserted to the lower border of the mandible the posterior fibers crosses the mandible at the anteroinferior angle of the masseter muscle and inserted to the 
angle of the mandible along with the rhizorius muscle. The anterior fibers they decussate cross the midline with the opposite side muscle and it uh, extends up to 2.5 cm behind the chin. Nerve supply, it is supplied by the cervical branch of the facial nerve. Action, it reduces the concavity of the side of the neck and it releases the pressure from the underlying wings. Therefore, it exerts an anti-sphincteric action and improves the venous return. The contraction of the entire muscle produces oblique wrinkles of the skin of the neck. The anterior fibers helps in the depression of the mandible. The posterior fibers draws the angle of the mandible downwards and laterally as an expression of horror or surprise. So if you see this platysma, it crosses two bones, the clavicle and the mandible, which are the first and the second bone to ossify in the human body. Next layer is the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. We will see the deep cervical fascia in detail later. Now here we will see the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia. So here the investing layer forms a roof of both anterior and the posterior triangles so when you see the extension from behind posterior to anterior it is attached to the ligamentum nuque then it uh, splits to enclose the trapezius muscle then it forms a roof of the posterior triangle then it splits to enclose the sternocleidomastoid muscle then it forms the roof of the anterior triangle and becomes continuous with the opposite side layer. When you take the superior attachment, it is attached to the lower border or the base of the mandible, the zygomatic arch, the external aspect of the mastoid process, the superior nuchal line and the external occipital protuberance. So when it is attached above, it splits to enclose two salivary gland, the parotid gland and the submandibular salivary gland. Lower attachment or inferior attachment, it is attached to the suprasternal notch of the manubrium sternum and here it splits to enclose the suprasternal space and it is attached to the superior aspect or surface of the clavicle and here it splits to enclose the supraclavicular space. Next we will see the superficial veins of the neck. The superficial veins of the neck include the external jugular vein and the anterior jugular vein. The external jugular vein is formed within the parotid gland by the union of the posterior division of the retromandibular vein and the posterior auricular vein. So again I repeat the posterior auricular vein joins with the posterior division of the retromandibular vein to form the external jugular vein. So this external jugular vein it passes downwards and backwards across the sternocleidomastoid muscle under cover of the platysma and it pierces the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia 2.5 cm above the clavicle and appears in the supraclavicular triangle and in, then terminates into the subclavian vein. The vein is provided with two pairs of valves, one at the termination of the subclavian vein, the other 4 cm above the clavicle. So between these two sets of valves, the vein is often dilated to form the sinus and these valves, they do not prevent the regurgitation of the blood. So if you see the relation, the greater auricular nerve ascends parallel and behind the upper part of the external jugular vein and the transverse cutaneous nerve passes deep to the external jugular vein. 
when you go with the tributaries the tributaries are the formative tributaries the posterior division of the retromandibular vein and the posterior auricular vein so these are the formative tributaries the other tributaries are the transverse cervical vein the supra scapular vein and the anterior jugular vein so these are the terminal tributaries the transverse cervical the supra scapular and the anterior jugular vein and occipital vein occasionally it receives the occipital vein and you get the oblique jugular vein which connects the external jugular vein with the internal jugular vein in the upper part of the neck then you get the posterior external jugular vein so this drains the superficial tissue of the posterior part of the scalp and the neck and accompanies the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and joins with the external jugular vein just below its midpoint so these are the tributaries of the external jugular vein so when you see the clinical anatomy related to the external jugular vein the external jugular vein when it pierces the deep fascia the deep fascia gets adherent to the vessel wall so whenever there is a cut in this region the deep fascia prevents the retraction of the vein hence the air may be sucked inside the vein causing air embolism so next we'll see the anterior jugular vein so the anterior jugular vein they are formed by the union of small veins tributaries which is around the submandibular region and it runs downwards and near the anterior median line of the neck it pierces the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia above the clavicle and it runs parallel above the clavicle under cover of the sternocleidomastoid muscle but superficial to the intrahyoid muscle and joins the external jugular vein close to its termination so the both sides anterior jugular vein are connected by the jugular venous arch in the suprasternal space next we'll see the cutaneous nerves of the neck the cutaneous nerves of the neck are four in number they are derived from the cervical plexus they radiate from the middle of the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and they include the lesser occipital nerve so this is the lesser occipital nerve so this is derived from the ventral ramus of the c2 spinal nerve and they hook around the accessory nerve and ascends along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and supplies the posterior part of the scalp behind the auricle and also the upper third of the cranial surface of the auricle the next cutaneous nerve is the great auricular nerve so this is derived from the ventral rami of c2 and c3 and this winds around the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and ascends up and divides into anterior branch and the posterior branch the anterior branch supplies the skin of the face over the angle of the mandible the posterior branch supplies the skin overlying the mastoid process and most of the lateral and the cranial surface of the auricle including the concha and the lobule the great auricular nerve accompanies the external jugular vein the upper half of the external jugular vein so this is the external jugular vein so it accompanies the upper half of the external jugular vein The next cutaneous nerve is the transverse cutaneous nerve of the neck. It is derived from the ventral rami of C2 and C3. It winds around the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, passes across the sternocleidomastoid muscle deep to the external jugular vein and at the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle it Uh, divides into an ascending branch and a descending branch and it supplies a wide area of the skin of front and the side of the neck
So the next cutaneous nerve is the supraclavicular nerve. The supraclavicular nerve emerges as a common trunk under cover of the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It is derived from the ventral rami of C3 and C4. The trunk descends beneath the platysma and the deep cervical fascia and it divides into medial, intermediate and the lateral supraclavicular nerve. The medial supraclavicular nerve passes superficial to the external jugular vein and gives a branch to the sternoclavicular joint and also supplies the skin up to the level of second rib. The intermediate branch passes superficial to the clavicle. Occasionally it pierces the clavicle and supplies the skin of the front of the chest up to the second rib. That is the level of the sternal angle. The lateral branch extends obliquely across the trapezius and gives a branch to the acromioclavicular joint and supplies the skin of the upper and the posterior part of the shoulder. So this completes an overall view of the superficial structures of the neck which forms the roof of the anterior and the posterior triangles.